And with that, I'd like to introduce uh, your program director, Bruce Shepard, who's uh, stepped in in a pinch uh, and is going to be presenting us his presentation on the slow decline of the bison. And uh, Bruce is our program director, as I mentioned. Uh, we're very grateful to have him with us. He's probably the only true historian amongst the whole bunch of us and, um, and has a, a strong background in historical studies and museum work. So with that, Bruce, I'll turn it over to you and off we go. Um, I was asked to uh, extend the apologies of our scheduled speaker, Norm Leach, um, who only was able to inform me on Monday that he would not be here. He's got a very bad cold. And he says it's the first time in 30 years of presenting that he's ever had to, to cancel. And he extends his sincere apologies. But we will reschedule him sometime in the new year. So I was never a starter in high school football, basketball, or soccer. I was always one of the guys that came off the bench. So here we go again, coming off the bench. Some of you will recall a similar presentation. Those of you that are members of the Archaeological Society, um, I assure you that while it is similar, I have been working on it. I have some new additional material. So uh, here we go. The decimation of the great North American bison herds was an environmental tragedy which Canadian and American scholars have continually placed at the moccasins and boots of human hunters on the Great Plains. While various groups have been targeted, selecting them for primary responsibility appears misdirected as mounting evidence indicates that the herds had been significantly reduced for decades by a variety of animal diseases. The near extermination of the bison on the Great Plains was more likely a long, slow, inexorable decline caused by the interaction of multiple factors. It probably began with the arrival of European cattle and their diseases in North America, accelerated due to selective overhunting during the fur trade era, and then stretched over the decades to the mid-1870s, culminating in a sudden sharp decline with the arrival of the infamous American hide hunters. The agricultural development of North America's grasslands on both sides of the border would be launched where the mourned herds had grazed for eons. Analyzing the waning of the bison herds should begin with the number of animals involved. An accurate count appears impossible since the plains environment has always been an active one and the size of the herds lightly rose and fell with natural conditions. Increasing evidence also indicates that the original peoples of the Americas carefully managed their environments to maximize food production. On the northern Great Plains, certain indigenous peoples revered the beaver and would not kill them or eat their flesh, much to the dismay of fur traders who coveted the pelts. Protecting the beaver showed a deep ecological insight, though, because the rodents' natural activities created small ponds and lakes across our arid northern plains where indigenous peoples could search for bison. And I will use, for example, with the Nitsitipi, who, of course, are Blackfoot neighbors, their most revered items are called the beaver bundle. A frequently cited figure of the herd's numbers on the plains has been over 60 million bison, but this was based upon the fleeting observations made by an American army officer in 1871. A more realistic estimate, centered upon the scientific calculations of range managers on the size of the herds the grasslands could support, has instead become a fluctuating number 
between 24 and 27 million animals. More than half of the supposed millions of bison probably never existed. Another important but debatable number was the growth rate of the herds. Or the number of animals added following replacement of the annual, annual natural mortality. One early attempt at a calculation put the figure at approximately 18% of the female bison population per year. Recent studies from Yellowstone Park indicate that predation and winter kill were lightly significantly greater than previously thought and that the actual growth rate was closer to 10% of the females in the herds each year. Applying these estimates to an earlier period on the Great Plains can be risky but revealing. Theoretically, herds of around 25 million animals of which slightly less than half were females, growing at 10% per year, should have been able to sustain their numbers, providing no more than one million or so animals were harvested each year. Since fewer than that number appear to have been taken by regional hunters, and bison essentially disappeared from the Great Plains by the early 1880s, other factors were lightly part of the equation. European expansion across the world's temperate climate zones has usually been explained in technological, economic, and political terms, but was also biological and included plants and animals as well as the diseases they carried. The development of agriculture and its spread from Africa and Asia to Europe exposed increasing numbers of humans to the diseases of domesticated livestock, and to a host of soil-borne parasites and microbes. It took centuries for Africans, Asians, and Europeans to develop levels of immunity, paying the biological price with generations of pain, suffering, and anguish. Tragically, the original peoples of the Americas had not developed such natural resistances and bore the dreadful consequences within a much shorter period of time. It has been estimated that over 60% and perhaps as high as 95% of the pre-Columbian human population of the Americas perished during plagues, epidemics, and pandemics, although the actual number of casualties continues to be the subject of fierce scholarly debate. Indigenous communities were devastated by diseases migrating via, via European trade conquest and settlement, and this calamity was probably mirrored in the bison herds which they hunted on the Great Plains. While the symptoms of the human diseases were generally well known and could be identified, if not always treated, such was not the case with the animal diseases. Most of these bacteria were not isolated and identified until the late 19th century. No veterinary testing was available and there were too few knowledgeable observers recording their impressions. Therefore, the presence of these animal diseases can only be deduced from the yet as slender, as yet slender, although steadily increasing information available. The decline of the bison was linked to diseases such as brucellosis, tuberculosis, and anthrax. Ancient strains of tuberculosis and anthrax were already present in North America but new European ones lightly added to their destructive effect. Brucellosis, though, was a European import and probably had a greater impact because it affected the bison herd's ability to reproduce. And I know there are ranchers in the audience, and so you'll be familiar with uh, the impact of brucellosis which, by the way, was named after a Dr. Bruce. <laughs> I make no claim. He discovered it on the island of Malta in the late 19th century. An ancient disease caused by a bacterium, brucellosis manifests itself in several ways in different hosts, including sheep, goats, swine, dogs, and cattle. 
the bovine or cattle variety, Brucella abortus, most lately arrived in North America from Europe in infected cattle, spread beyond the presence of cattle herds through contaminated birthing tissues and fluids. It can cause spontaneous abortions as well as sterility, both of which would have affected the reproduction of the bison. While brucellosis would have dramatically changed the bison replacement and growth rates, it was not a mass killer. Once ca calves were born, it passed to them while nursing and eventually colonized entire herds. North America's bison herds apparently had brucellosis by the early 19th century. This seems the most logical explanation for how a young indigenous woman living on the northwest corner of the Great Plains contracted the disease. At some point during the late 1820s or early 1830s, she passed away and was buried by her people. Her remains were accidentally discovered and scientifically examined before a respectful reinternment. The analysis revealed that she had cavities and erosion in her bones consistent with having suffered from brucellosis. Human symptoms of the disease are characterized by rising and falling fevers, which can be quite severe. Long-term consequences also include arthritis, hepatitis, and anemia. While not usually fatal, it can lead to lethal complications such as pneumonia and bacterial meningitis. Humans usually get brucellosis from regularly ingesting unpasteurized dairy products. We can also contract it by blood-to-blood -blood transfer through butchering infected animals. Since it was improbable that a young indigenous woman of that era and area was consuming cow's milk, cheese, or butter uh, while maturing, then she was most likely infected when helping process an animal with the disease. Given that the indigenous peoples of the northern Great Plains subsisted mainly on bison, they were the most likely source of her infection. This points to B. abortus, having begun colonizing North American's bison herds shortly after the arrival of European cattle in what became Mexico. The disease would have then spread up the Great Plains over the century before reaching the region's northwest apex by the early 19th century. And uh, this is uh, Wendy Unfried and her crew at the site, it's in a farmer's field just outside of Viking, Alberta. So in the Battle River Valley, right at the northwest apex of the plains. And it's not just one piece of evidence. She had brucellosis, we know that from her bones. But it's also geographical, where it's located. That's pretty far north and pretty far inland. And thirdly, she died at some point in the late 1820s and 1830s. So brucellosis is on the northern Great Plains very early. And the question becomes, of course, how did it get there? Well, the nearest cattle that we know of at the time are in the Red River Valley. And none of them are known to have escaped. In fact, they had a heck of a time keeping them alive because of wolf attacks and the famous cold Manitoba winters. The next closest cattle are in Wisconsin. So the likelihood is that she contracted it in helping her grandmother or mother uh, cut up an animal, and the most likely animal is the bison. Nor was brucellosis the only European imported disease to assault the bison herds although the other two had precursors. Mycobacterium bovis, known as cattle TB, and its human cousin, Mycobacterium tuberculosis, are related to a complex of ancient bacterium. Early strains of these two particular types appear to have entered North America with the animal and human populations via Beringia, or the landmass which once connected with Asia. Evidence for such a disease migration has been found in the remains of huge ancient form of bison which, one, which once roamed the North American grasslands. It had a type of M. bovis. The human variety has been found in the remains of mummified bodies in the Peruvian mountains. 
Versions of these disorders also migrated to North America via Europeans and their cattle. It has been estimated that between one quarter and one half of the cattle transported across the land Atlantic had M. bovis, and that most of the people making the journey had active tuberculosis or were carriers. The indigenous peoples of eastern North America were probably quickly exposed to a European human variety and it then made its way west with the French fur trade. It does not appear to have had a major impact on the peoples of the northern plains until after the destruction of the bison herds when their immune systems were compromised by starvation. The inadequate Canadian government response where have I heard that phrase before? <laughs> the inadequate Canadian government response to the food crisis, which developed in the 1880s and 1890s, together with the monstrous decision to withhold provisions to enforce bureaucratic edicts, led to far too many deaths and to serious health problems, which continue to this day. While M. tuberculosis was making its way west, M. bovis likely joined B. abortus in their infectious journey north up the Great Plains. Given the manner of transmission, it would have been extraordinary if the bison herds had not been infected. Mycobacterium bovis can be contracted by inhalation, from grazing, or through breaks in the skin's surface. It survives in pastures for months and possibly longer were cold, wet, and damp. It can remain dormant in animals for years, but activates during stressful periods or by aging. Both the cattle and human versions leave bone tracers, but are essentially flesh diseases which take their name from the tubercles or small rounded nodules which form in the lungs, liver, spleen, lymph nodes, and they can lead to long, slow decline and death. While there has been understandably litten, little written evidence of M. bovis or B. abortus in bison, there was a solid natural indicator of their presence in the North American herds. It was frequently noted that huge packs of wolves regularly followed the herds. Possibly, at one time, there were more than one million and perhaps as many as two million wolves inhabiting the Great Plains. Such a significant population of predators, along with other carnivores, such as plains grizzly bears, cougars, and coyotes, could have been supported by scavenging bison fetuses aborted by B. abortus or dispatching animals weakened by M. bovis. In doing so, they were performing their natural function of keeping the herds vigorous but would have been consuming the evidence of the infections. An abundance of wolf packs and other predators probably also had a role in disguising the impact of another lethal disease, which was a ruthlessly efficient bison killer. Anthrax was the natural butcher. Also an ancient disease, <coughs> excuse me, Also an ancient disease, it was the possible cause of the fifth and sixth plagues of Egypt reported in the Bible. Its symptoms also describe the Black Bane, which ravaged Europe in 1613. Another bacterium, anthrax takes the form of a soil-borne spore. Surviving in a dormant state for decades, it can be released from the soil by drought, a common occurrence on North America's Great Plains, as we all know, being in the, what, fifth year of our latest drought? Or by animal disturbance, such as wallowing, a frequent activity of bison. Once airborne and inhaled by animals, it colonizes their lungs and germinates within 60 days. It poisons its hosts with toxins produced by its replication. A gruesome death follows, occurring in 80 to 90% of untreated cases, and characterized by swelling, bleeding, and coal black skin ulcers leading to gangrene. The millions of new spores produced return to the soil with the rotting carcasses to await new victims or to spread to other areas by scavengers. 
An ancient strain of anthrax had apparently also migrated to North America via Beringia. In 1981, head smashed in Buffalo Jump became a UNESCO World Heritage Site in southwestern Alberta, just north of the border with Montana. For centuries, indigenous peoples had cleverly driven primarily cow and calf herds of bison over a steep cliff, dispatching and then butchering them for their needs. The bison bones built up over 6,000 years, so at the deepest levels long predated the European arrival in North America. When the site was being studied in the 1960s, researchers at these lower levels were regularly getting sick. A soil analysis was ordered and revealed the presence of anthrax-like spores, a lesson regarding taking proper precautions when doing archaeological fieldwork. It appears that at least some of the bison originally herded to their deaths had previously contracted what was most likely a Beringian form of the disease. The presence of other European strains of anthrax in North America lightly date to the Spanish colonization of the now American Southwest and the French settlement of Louisiana and spread to the southern Great Plains around 1800. They seem to have migrated up the Mississippi and Ohio River valleys and in 1819, a disease matching, matching anthrax symptoms appeared in cattle near Bardstown, Kentucky south of Louisville, which is, well, you can see where Kentucky is there. And Bardstown is just, uh, Louisville is just about where Illinois and Indiana meet, but on the other side of the Ohio River. In 1824, a physician in Bardstown reported another outbreak, which now included four farmers who had handled more diseased cattle carcasses, but apparently survived. In 1821, a large number of bison died from a mysterious illness along the Peace River in what became northern British Columbia and northern Alberta. When it struck again in 1823 and once more in 1831, the symptoms were noted by both the fur traders and the indigenous peoples of the Athabasca country. Their descriptions strongly point to anthrax as the culprit. If the contemporary outbreaks along the Ohio and Peace Rivers, where I'm not going to point out where the Peace River is to this group. You, you all know where it is. If the contemporary outbreaks along the Ohio and Peace Rivers were in fact anthrax, as appears lightly, then there should have been intervening ones on the vast expanses of the Great Plains which separated the two locations. So if you go from the bend in the Kentucky straight up through southern Illinois, Iowa, South Dakota, North Dakota, Cypress Hills, central Alberta up to the Peace River country, right along that axis, happens to conform to part of the central flyway of bird migration. But that's another matter. If the contemporary outbreaks are long, yeah, while well, the written record remains mute, they probably happened, but were simply not observed or recorded. This lack of documentary evidence has caused problems for scholars, particularly historians, whose research methodology can be heavily dependent on such written sources. Too many of them have discounted the impact of diseases such as anthrax on the bison herds and arrived at conclusions which are essentially scholarly disciplinary boundaries. Given the nature of anthrax, how it spreads and its devastating impact, conceivably entire herds of bison could have been infected, died, and the only indication of the tragedy would have been their bleached bones on the plains the following year, which would easily be mistaken for the remnants of a large hunt. There are reports of a phenomenon known as die-ups, which strongly point to such a possibility. In 1867, the noted Texas rancher, Charles Goodnight, reported seeing thousands of bison lying dead in the Conscious River Valley of today's New Mexico. 
An unknown Indigenous observer reported a similar incident in 1879 near our Cypress Hills, approximately halfway between Kentucky and the Peace River country. If such die-ups were in fact anthrax, anthrax episodes, it would seem that the disease had become more widespread on the Great Plains with the arrival of the European varieties and began contributing to the decline of the bison herds. It was possible, but unlikely, that the die-ups were instead caused by bovine babesiosis, or Texas fever, a blood disease transported in ticks by Texas longhorn cattle. Bison would not be particularly susceptible because they have several natural defenses against ticks, which make a widespread infection doubtful. Anthrax, though, still kills bison in characteristic groupings. Between 1962 and 1993, nine anthrax episodes were reported in bison in Canada's Northwest Territories and in Northern Alberta, killing more than 1,300 animals. In 2007, 83 bison and cattle died from the disease in four, four locations across Alberta. In 2008, it appeared on a private ranch in Montana and in 2018, it killed 13 bison on a ranch near Fort St. John, BC, in the Peace River country. It returned this past summer, 2022, when nearly 60 bison carcasses were located in the Wood Buffalo National Park, three of which were confirmed to have died from anthrax. In August of this year, anthrax was reported in nine animal deaths in the rural municipality of Piapot in Saskatchewan, just near the Cypress Hills. The lightly attacks on the bison herds by diseases which reduce their numbers and their ability to make up the losses overlapped with steadily increasing and increasingly selective human hunting. The indigenous peoples of the Great Plains had hunted bison for millennia to feed, clothe, and shelter their families. They knew their quarry well, and utilized their prey's own behavior to herd bison over cliffs, such as head smashed in, or into corrals called pounds where they were slain. The reintroduction of the horse to North America by the Spanish and that animal spread up the Great Plains allowed the hunters to range more widely, aided their selectiveness of prey, and thus increased their effectiveness. Still, as successful as they were, it is doubtful whether indigenous hunters on the Great Plains took more than three quarters of a million animals annually to meet their people's needs, particularly since their own populations had been decimated by three smallpox epidemics between 1775 and 1862. The growing trade in pemmican on the Northern Plains, which is essentially pounded bison meat, attracted the attention of some peoples. They recognized it as an opportunity to obtain the trade goods they desired. Soon, groups were specializing in supplying provisions. They began taking more animals than they required to supply themselves, although it could be argued that their needs also included trade goods. Still, it was unlikely that these provisioning specialists contributed substantially to the bison's decline in the Northern Plains because of the impact of human diseases from which it would have taken decades to recover. An apparent consequence of these human epidemics was the emergence of another group as provisioners of the northern fur trade and the Red River Colony, or what's now Winnipeg. The offspring of Quebec fur traders and their indigenous partners, they initially called themselves Bois Brûlé, a French term meaning burned wood and possibly a jocular reference to their complexions. Then, in what appears to have been a clever display of word capture and reversal, they adopted what had lately been a derogatory term and began calling themselves Métis, feminine Métis. They also developed a unique society based upon their Roman Catholic religion, the French language, as well as the quasi-military structure of their bison hunts and came to see themselves as a distinct people, the new nation. 
to supply their own families the remaining fur trade needs and meet the growing demand for food at the Red River settlement, it has been estimated that Métis hunters took more than 80,000 bison a year. That total may have been higher due to wastage because according to one contemporary observer, the hunters were lucky if they utilized a third of the animals they killed. In 1856, a chronicler of the Red River Colony observed, and I quote, the last animal killed is the first skinned, and night, not infrequently, surprises him at his work. What remains is lost and falls to the wolves. Hundreds of animals are sometimes abandoned, for even a thunderstorm in an hour uh, can render the meat useless. This claim appears somewhat suspicious, though, because it does not mention their families, the Métis and their children, who are known to accompany the hunters and help with the butchering. Still, when combined, the total number of animals lightly harvested by Indigenous and Métis hunters, including some wastage, would only have come perilously close to the potential million or so annual increase of the herds. It seems possible that these totals were still less than what nature needed for the herds to continue. Despite what statisticians, accountants, and politicians tell us, all numbers are questionable. And these are probably deceptive because considerable evidence points to the majority of the bison killed being cows, the breeding stock of the herds. It was widely recognized that all hunters preferred female bison when hunting and selected them for killing. As one old hunter recalled, and I quote, we like to shoot buffalo cows because they had the best meat, the, fatterest, the fattest and tenderest. And in the fall and winter, they had the best hides. The two-year-old animals had fine hides. We shot, shot those in June and July when they were fat and profitable for pemmican. The hides of the old buffalo were poor. The hair was too coarse. In fall, we shot nothing but cows. They were fine for pemmican and dried meat. We were very particular about choosing our animals. This was our business. Selectively harvesting females from any herding species decreases the breeding population. Predation, diseases, and other natural hazards continue, resulting in fewer and fewer calves born each year. In addition, bison calves are particularly reliant on their mothers until the next calf arrives. Deliberately targeting the females not only eliminated them and any offspring they were carrying, but probably doomed many young calves as well. Under such circumstances, the growth rate of the herds eventually ends, then the annual natural mortality cannot be replaced, and ultimately the species begins a long, slow, but steady decline. Outrage, sorrow, and regret were being expressed even as the American hide hunters were completing the final slaughter of the great bison herds. Perhaps this is why so many commentators and scholars uh, since have focused on human factors as the primary agent of the decline. Increasing evidence, though, reveals a very different explanation indicating that animal diseases played a far more significant roles and that the hunters were chasing a species already in decline. The waning of the great North American bison herds became a critical factor in the transformation of our grasslands. The power of the indigenous peoples of the region was undermined, while the Métis became more reliant on their limited land holdings. Covetous eyes from the east and south began examining the northern Great Plains for agricultural development. The struggle for control which resulted continues to shape us even today. Thank you. I'm not usually such a morbid person as many of you who know me, but um, you have to go where the evidence takes you. 
And this evidence was just too much for me to deal with in any other way. Yeah. It's sad, it's tragic, but I think it's a much better explanation of what was going on than some of the rather romanticized and fanciful descriptions that one hears uh, still, even today. Appreciate knowing for sure the facts. It's all provable. I didn't bring my end notes, <laughs> but... Um, but they didn't burn the carcasses of the anthrax. They didn't? They didn't burn the, the carcasses of the no. anthrax. No, they, 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 when Charles Goodnight, who was a very famous Texas rancher, uh, if any of you have read Lonesome Dove, that great Western novel, he's one of the characters. He's um, Tommy Lee Jones' character. That's Charles Goodnight. And he did take his buddy home from Montana to be buried. That's an absolutely true story. And uh, McMurtry um, romanticized it. But that, that part of it is a true story. He went from Montana back to Texas with his buddy. Wasn't the word Chuck Wagon named after Charles Goodnight? That's one of the theories that Ch Chuck was Charles, yeah, Charles Goodnight. Uh, Chuck had also become a commonplace term for food. But whether that was also Chuck, <laughs> It's one of those terms that, oh, let it be true. It's, it's so good. <laughs> I'm sorry, Tom. I, the no, no. question started right away. But no, they, they, they would not have burned the carcasses because they, like Goodnight, he came across them. They were already, and the Con Conscious River Valley is in southeastern New Mexico. And that area, this, this is really scary, that, that area where he witnessed this, is now a lake reservoir. But anthrax is not water soluble, so is it in, still in the lake bed? Yeah. Quite possibly, <laughs> but. But, but uh, um, at the um, farm, uh, they always burn the carcasses. Yes, so, yes. I, I mean, the, the, the irony here is, of course, that farmers are often criticized for breaking the natural prairie, etc. But in doing that, they probably killed millions of anthrax spores without knowing it. Uh, uh, but they're still there as the infestation or the outbreak at Piapot. I mean, that's just across the, I, we drive by Piapot on the Trans-Canada Highway. Just south of there, some farmer is wrestling with an anthrax outbreak. And ranchers know all about, yeah. How did I do on the descriptions, by the way? <laughs> Yeah. yeah. I'm completely paranoid now. <laughs> <laughs> so, are you saying like pre-European and pre-South American contact that it would be more of a healthy environment and it was that kind of contact that started all these things? Define healthier. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah and the natural world is like, I, I'm an angler. I, I've been fishing since I was seven years old on the bank of the Red River of the North in Winnipeg. And when we came here, you go looking for fishing spots. And I found one, and I really enjoyed going out there. It's the Souter Reservoir, which is one of the irrigation lakes just west of here. But its other name is Rattlesnake Lake. <laughs> Warning. <laughs> and I've been going out there for 10 years, and yes, I have seen rattlesnakes just this last summer. My brother-in-law and I were walking along, and, <laughs> and okay, and he was a quite a big young guy, you just move around. Nature is dangerous. You, you're, you live, in, <laughs> you, gotta be, you gotta be careful. And so, yeah, do you think it was, like I know the nose flies are brought up by longhorn cattle, yeah. like we have sand flies, and, and so I, I know all this stuff is brought in. And we have so many, like the magpies and the desert <laughs> aren't native to Canada. Yeah. So, like, so it, no, it, it didn't it, all change. That was one of the points when the Europeans arrived. That was one of the points I was trying to make, is there is evidence of anthrax and TB in North America before the Europeans arrived. But they're different strains. And nature adapts and changes. I mean, one of the reasons for 
uh, a 10% increase in the herds is nature's way of, I mean, it happens to humans too. There's slightly more males born than female humans every year. And the reason for that is women are stronger. Physically. No, you are. But I'm not sure all the feminists would appreciate why. Because you're equipped for childbearing. That's nature's way. So young boys are not as vigorous, so nature gives them a few more to be born so that the populations, and it appears that it, it's similar with, with bison. It's like 47% of the herds are female. There's always more surplus bulls than, and then of course the bulls fight and like guys do. And I mean, you can see this behavior in any bar on Friday night. I mean, it's <laughs> still going on for crying out loud. <laughs> We'd like to think we've escaped all that, but no, no, no. Yes? I was wondering, you said there were a lot of different animals that can be uh, affected by these diseases. Yes. So, did you say canine also? There apparently is a canine variety, yes. So were the wolves? Yeah. Well, that, that's interesting. I, I have not found any literature. I don't know that it's been studied yet. I did find one study of anthrax in wolves. And they observed a large male eating on a, a consuming a anthrax killed bison. And they followed him for several days, showed no ill effects, but then they killed it to study the, and the anthrax spores had located in several internal organs, but they were still studying it. So we don't know whether there's some, I, I know if I were a scientist studying anthrax and was looking for a cure, I would study how carnivores handle it. Um, we know, for example, that certain bird species are not affected by strychnine are not strict, um, uh, what's the, um, there's certain fruits and, um, oh, the, the berries? yeah, the berries that are poisonous to humans. Oh, uh, oh holly berries? Yeah, 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 but what's the chemical, um, I don't know. I'm going to say strychnine, but it's not. No. I'm sorry. No. But birds can eat them. Birds are not affected by it. Certain birds are not affected by it. We are. And it may be that wolves are not. I mean, and, and would stand to reason if you're a carnivore species, you would have to have some adaptation. But I, I haven't found anything in the literature yet. Uh, I just kind of focused on the, the cattle ones because that seemed to, uh, uh, bison are actually a form of antelope but they are apparently susceptible to all cattle diseases, uh, black leg, pneumonia, plural pneumonia, I mean, you name it, they, they seem to be susceptible to it, which would stand to reason. They're a grazing species. I'm sorry? Apparently, yeah, I, I would defer to people who know more on that, I, as they say, this is, I should have perhaps explained this earlier, this is part of a larger study that I'm doing, and many of you know, about what I call the American presence in Western Canada. So one of the first things I had to deal with was, well, all of those nasty American hide hunters slaughtered off the bison. Everybody blames the Americans for it. We Canadians are great at that. You know, we had a problem, we can blame the Americans. <laughs> And we do it a lot. <laughs> uh, Jack Granitstein, one of the deans of Canadian history, wrote a whole book on it. It's, it's called Living with Uncle. <laughs> and it's very funny in parts, but he does point out that, uh, and, and it's, it's, it's kind of natural. I mean, the, the Ukrainians blame the Russians for everything, and with good reason, as we're seeing right now. But you can pretty much go across the globe, and if you want to know the best insult for a people, ask their neighbors, because it, it just seems this human nature to have these 
feuds with your neighbors. So we Canadians and America, and as I say to my American friends, I'm glad you're our neighbors. I'm Scottish. <laughs> the English were not great neighbors. But then the English would say that about the Scots. <laughs> with good reason. <laughs> but, it, but it's ancient. And, and uh, so when I came across this, that the American hide hunters were to blame, I thought, okay, I'm going to have to deal with this. It's a negative American presence. But the more I dug into it, the more I thought, okay, these numbers are not adding up. There is just no way that 60 million bison could have been taken, killed in 10 years. No way. And then it turns out it wasn't even in 10 years because really it's 1876 with the Battle of the Little Bighorn, when the Lakota are removed from the Northern Plains, that the, the hide hunters, they, so you got 1876, and they're gone by 1883, in seven years. How could they kill that many animals? Well, then I started looking at the animal, and it's found this great book by a biologist from Berkeley University, University of California, Berkeley, a bison specialist, grew up on a bison ranch in Montana. And he, he was curious about these, where did the 60 million come from? Well, it turns out it's a made up number. It's a guess by an American army officer on the banks of the Red River of Arkansas, Oklahoma, Oklahoma Texas in 1871. He looked at a field of bison and counted and guessed how many there were for the rest of the Great Plains. That's where the 60 million comes from. So what is it? So what's your carrying capacity of your land, <laughs> your ranch? So you ask the range good. managers. But that's an important, <laughs> yeah. Ranchers have figured that, you know, ask the range managers, get an idea of how many cattle you can. And so that's what he did. He went and said, okay, range managers, how, given the expanse of the Great Plains, how many bison could it have supported? And the best estimate he, they came up with was a fluctuating number between 24 and 27 million animals. Well, why does it fluctuate? Drought, flooding, 2013, we had the flood here. That would have wiped out whole herds trying to get across the rivers. Which again is why nature gives that extra bit of 10% to make up the numbers. What fascinated me though was that if you listen to the indigenous elders, and I've lived in Manitoba, Saskatchewan, and Alberta, so I've had, and in museums, we have quite a few dealings with indigenous elders. Every nation always says, we never took more than we needed, ever. And I thought, okay, pretty hard to implement, but that's an ideal. Okay, so they were obviously trying well, how could they do that? Well, how do you know when your herd is going to increase by next year? You count calves. I think they were counting calves. And they were able to estimate how many animals they could safely take. And that's what they did. Now, when the Métis come in, they say the same thing. We never took more than we could use. Now, they're selling for pemmican and so on. But if the indigenous peoples are taking three quarters of a million, approximately, and the Métis are taking 80, 100, 200,000, you're still not even at a million. And a million, 100, 150,000 is what that 10% constitutes. So if the indigenous peoples and the Métis are not taking the whole million, and yet the bison are in decline, well, what else is going on? There's got to be other factors going on. So the more I dug into it, and I got to tell you, this was all being written just before the pandemic hit. And then when the pandemic hit, I became a germaphobe just <laughs> instantly because I thought, my God, this is, this is it again. This is here, here Mother Nature, she can be in cantankerous. Even as in the 1880s, there was outrage and sorrow and neglect 
A scientist working for the Smithsonian wrote a famous pamphlet absolutely decrying the butchering, lambasted his own countrymen who were the hide hunters, but also took a, took a shot at the Canadian Métis. And from then on, everybody's blamed human factors. And Lord knows they were there. I mean, the Métis, they, they were bison hunters. But they say, we never took too many. <laughs>